Spiders, we are live from IMARC. Hence all the bloody background noise. Which is a bit wild, mate. We talk about having plenty of conversations on the road today, boys. Talk about getting stitched up. They've put us right next to the uh, the picks and shovels, sort of whatever's going on oh, yeah, here. There's a heap of bloody rock, lit- rock lickers smashing rocks in the background. <laughs> so anyway, don't, don't worry about them. They haven't got a podcast. Mate, we've got a bit of a special guest with us today. We've just found a bit of a straggler walking past the uh, walking past the tent. Benny Nolan, mate, pri- private investor. Welcome to Money of Mine, live from IMark Cobber. How we doing, boys? Oh, mate, Love your work. Sensational. Now, out doing of well. all the people we spoke to today, we spoke to numerous, you took the – you've – Cut the mustard to come on the show. Well, there you go. I don't know what I did. <laughs> oh, mate, you mentioned mate, you got, three you, letters. You got a story to tell. A, V, and Z. Yeah, that, <laughs> those three. Those three letters are haunting me too. <laughs> yeah. Mate, we're going. We're going to get right into. It. We'll give a bit of a recap of what's been going on. But mate, first we're going to thank you. We've got some new sponsors. We're brought on board, mm. and they and they are looking to do work. All across Australia, right where we are now, WA and everything, boys. Mm. Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. Who are they? MMTS. McMahon Mining Title Services. What a wicked business this one is. We had the bloody absolute privilege. Very, very interesting (laughs) as well. Now, and let's go in. So, look, this team is led by Eva. She's the managing director. Then you've also got Helen and Shannon. Shannon was, his family founded the business. He's taken it on. Eva's the top dog now. They look after everyday mining title compliance. So it's pretty much if they don't renew your mining title, you can bloody lose your project which you don't want to happen. And you don't want to put that responsibility on yourself. So you may as well get someone else to do it for you. There's so much that goes into keeping a good standing with your tenure. There's so much that goes into um, all, all the stuff you've got to do for a new application. And like these, uh, the, the, this team, uh, they are the absolute experts. I couldn't believe some of the stats when we had the privilege of having a coffee um, with the team there about just how many, how many companies they've already got on their books. It's something like 200 companies work with them. They, they are the market leader. If you are, and they, they do it across the spectrum of like junior company all the way through to like some well, bloody pretty big much size pro- companies. Prospector all the way up to your companies as big as like IGO uh, and everything. So absolutely, it's seriously impressive the 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 amount that this team have, um, you know, provided a really quality service. And they've what they've done is they've absolutely excelled in Western Australia, but they've built out that expertise to the other states in Australia now. And 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 hopefully, you know, through our podcast and listenership, you know, we can. Um, we, we, we can we can help them dominate the other states as well because they have the team, the expertise, the diligence, the focus in order to to really um to really make sure that the companies that are in this space do what they need to do to keep on top of the team. Well, I think, and I'd like to think, being the experts that they are, Trav, that they would have done it themselves. But I feel like money of mine are just going to really accelerate that for them across Queensland, New South Wales, South Australia, Northern Territory, as well as what they're already doing in WA. So look, money miners out there, if you're part of a company and you write the checks and you're looking for a bit of support on everyday mining title compliance, title applications, acquisitions, support with land access, title approvals, title DD to support larger projects, um, look, get in touch with McMahon Mining Title Services. As per usual, links are in the show notes. They're absolute gurus in this space of anything titles. Don't lose your mining project. Oh, one last thing. I know we spent spent ages talking about it, but it's worth it. It's the first one. Worthy business. Worthy business. And the like. The, the other thing, why are they market leaders, right? They've developed this like proprietary software that enables them to keep on top of this stuff in a way that no one else has. So don't even bother going to someone else for this because they're going to be more expensive. They don't have the proprietary software to do it in a, as, as diligent a way. Um, and competitors are going to have a higher cost basis because... You know, they require more people to do the stuff that the, their systems do. So yeah, it's a very, no-brainer. Very good, mate. Now, thanks for getting on board, MMTS. <laughs> and look, and a good little partner of the partner, you'd say. Now, for OGs, any time expiration, because tell you what, you take away the mining title, you don't, you're not, uh, any time can't do anything. So I feel that MMTS keep any time and all the other exploration companies out there alive and thriving in the business. And when we say any time expiration, it's any time, it's anything, it's any altitude, any terrain, any uranium level, they will 
bloody deliver like radioactivity. anything. <laughs> exploration, Seamus and Victoria Murphy, recruitment, mm. uh, core cutting, bloody Polaris off-road bloody buggies to get to absolute <laughs> buttfuck nowhere in the Soil bush to sampling, go drill some oil. Soil storage. sampling. Jesus Christ, I'm pumped up to be in Sydney, boys. <laughs> how good is it? Thanks any time for the AG Cheers, sponsors. James. We should have a chat about what it, how, how, how have you found iMark so far, gents? <laughs> Like J- got- JD, coming from um, you, considering where you've come from as an ind- individual of not <laughs> um, getting pulled up in the street by people, to now, how Mate, would you rate Spending it? so much time with you, I've become a natural, people just coming up to me, conversation. <laughs> it took us about till, what do you reckon, guys, one in the afternoon to get set up here? <laughs> Must have spoken We've been with trying every, for ages just to fucking record something. Spoken with every man and their dog here at iMark. But I needed to piss for about two hours yeah i was trying to have a piss for two hours and uh anyway we've ripped a feed into us we've got some water in us we enjoyed a few to his news last night just three we're very moderate, responsible. Very responsible. And we're, uh, mate, we've met some fan- oh, so we've met talk- cool people. I was talking right? to someone from the uh, Saudi Arabia <laughs> Ministry for Resources. That, I'm like, wow, they're this is a- You don't get that in West Perth, yeah. Mate, they're well, looking to do. deploy some capital. <laughs> they're plenty of capital. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if they want to pass the sniff test. Mm. <laughs> yeah, didn't go well for Live Golf. <laughs> but, anyway, mate, didn't it go phenomenally well? Didn't they take out the PGA? Oh, no, the uh, publicity. All right. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the press conferences were a bit intense. Yeah. Anyway, let's not get on to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Um, mate, yeah. what about you, Trav? Yeah, it, interesting. Like it's it's cool. We, we we're parked up in the part of the conference where there are a bunch of mining services companies, and um, it's actually pretty cool to see all the. Different I'm glad we're on this side. Yeah, away from all the exploration companies. <laughs> the other side is exploration. <laughs> Although when we did a few laps in there, we bumped into I think three fund managers within um, within sort of ten minutes, and it was. That was some cool conversations. Two of them we'd never met before and I wasn't even sure if they liked our work, but they did like our work and they expressed that. Uh, that yeah, they, they told us that. that. That was really gratifying for me. One of those funds, I won't mention them because they won't want to be on, but it was one that I used to look up to a lot for a long time. And um, it was kind of really- planted the seed with them, but Trav. Really, fu- really freaking cool to have yeah. Yeah, someone that works there sort of say that they love our podcast. Um, right. Yeah, Couldn't agree more. You're going to see some of them on the show sooner or later, I reckon. We'll, we'll wear them down, Trav. Yes. But they're, they're funds, you know, we've we've spoken of, we've spoken about personally for, for years. So it's pretty pretty cool to get that. And, you know, a whole bunch of other people. Kingsley Jones, another one. We mm. interviewed three or four months ago, never met him face to face. Finally had the privilege and maybe we'll interview him later on as well. Yeah, so it's pretty cool to, to put a face to all these names of people that we've sort of spoken about and know of. Right. Now, you've been waiting very bloody patient there, Benny. <laughs> and just, just for the record, we've conned him into this. He's yeah. not one of Introduce those. Introduce us average Joe quickly. Mate, <laughs> but, but there's been plenty of people trying to uh, uh, get them, walk them. Some people have actually just started sitting here presuming they're going to be on. <laughs> I've had to tell them to piss off. But, uh, mate, we've, uh, <laughs> we've, we just thought you'd have a very cool story to share and your unique little thing, not unique, but I guess unique on our show, we have never talked to an AVZ shareholder that was in from the start still mm. held shares to the point where it all went to shit essentially mm. well you have to well i have to hold the shares now you would say they're in involuntary escrow <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'm not sure how unique it is last time i read there was twenty one thousand retail shareholders across australia yeah locked up holding shares in avz with oh no well, no that's, no chance then, of selling. It, it, but isn't it funny? This is, oh, I think, the first conversation we've had with one of them. Yeah. No, no, we've, have we? Do you remember? It was a bit of a fruit loop. The guy that we called. But recorded. Based in, oh, we haven't recorded That was one. off the record. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's a story we're keen to, to tell. Yeah. And um, we've been intimidated to sort of get across the plethora of information that there is to get across to tell the story properly. Because we want to do it we're gonna do it. We're going to do it sooner or later. <laughs> we will do it. We will do it. There's a lot of angles to it. Ben, we want to know your journey mate yeah, as a you. bloody as a bloody how the hell did you end up buying it in 2018 what's the appeal you know buying shares in AVZ in 2018 yeah well I mean to start it's good to hear that um, you know I'm, I'm coming from a low base having you having uh, the fact that you've only talked to a, a Fruit Loop so <laughs> <laughs> but I think you, you know you have to be a bit of a Fruit Loop to get to get involved in, in some respect and um, but I guess you know in, in 2018 I was looking at the um, at the lithium thesis, uh, I was a kind of avid consumer of uh, the Joe Lowry podcast back then. Yeah. Um, and Good friend of the show. Yeah, and, and actually caught the lithium kind of bug 
um, on the way down. And so I kind of averaged in, I think my first purchase was around 17 cents and then got in again at, at 10 and then nine and eight and, and, and the lowest point was, was four cents. Um, and what was, what would their market cap be when they were four cents? Oh, low, low, like double digit millions, was it? Like, yeah, back then, 50 to 100 mil yeah, market right. cap, you're yeah. thinking, yeah, some, something like that. I mean, it was definitely on the speculative end of the market, and and look, I was happy to happy to play in that in that space. So, you know, I've got to, I've, I've got to take my poison to, 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 to some degree because, you know, when you look at the jurisdiction risk of the DRC, yeah. um, if you look at some of the, like I was aware of some of um, the salaries that um, the executives were getting paid as well, and, and that was a little bit of a red flag. Uh, but what drew me to it was just the quality of the of the resource. You know, some of the the drill results that they were you know that they were pulling out back then were were phenomenal, and even to this day, it's it's um, you know it's a globally significant um, resource, probably the second largest lithium deposit anywhere in the world. And to to paint the picture a bit more, going back, this is at the back end of that first lithium price spike, where I think Spod touched on and peaked around a thousand, which is you know. We're still at double that. And to put AVZ in a bit more contents, context, Monono was the flagship asset back then, st still is back now. There was no other projects that were taking any of their attention, right? No, yeah, correct, yeah. And they had um, they had a, a power station um, nearby, um, which, uh, you know, which meant that they could get power to the, to the resource. So that, you know, they were, while it was pretty risky, there were like some boxes being ticked, but but overall, just the the size, the sheer size and the quality of the resource was, you know, was enough to kind of get in there and 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 have a crack. And then you you hold it through 2019 and lithiums, you know, in the doldrums. We spoke about various Enough. projects going into to bankruptcy. Even through 2020, it hadn't really picked yeah. up. You know, yeah. Pilgangora, Pilbara pick up the neighbouring asset. You know, Bold Hill in 2019 mm -hmm. goes into admin. And it's quiet, but you're sort of waiting for that next pickup in the in the EV. Yeah, to be cycle. fair, I'm seeing I'm seeing um, like the share prices of the lithium stocks go down and and licking my lips. So, I mean, AVZ wasn't my only you know lithium stock that I brought. I, I brought into um, Pilbara and a number of other um, lithium companies. Oh, so we stopped feeling sorry for you then. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I was quite happy to see the share price go down because I, I, I knew that the you know the, the supply squeeze was coming, um, uh, and then obviously the things that kind of you know, unfolded, you know, later down the track were, um, you know, were somewhat out of my control, although there were some kind of sort of signs that things might not necessarily be, be completely right as well. And those signs, you start to see them 2021. And like, by this point, AVZ's flying. It's, I think it trades over a dollar at some point. Yeah. It hits a $4.6 billion market cap in sort of late 2021 from my understanding. Goes into halt in May of 2022, still at a market cap of 2.6 billion. Are you thinking at the time, oh, this is just going to be a couple of days and we're out of this? Or it was quite interesting. I'd, I'd already started to roll out of a lot of my lithium stocks, sort of because I'd been in. Um, AVZ one of them. I'd been in so early, but I hadn't. I hadn't rolled out of of AVZ because um, it was still kind of undervalued based on what it, you know the resource that it had in yeah. in the ground. So that was the rationale of why you. Rolling out of others and not that one. You still and believe well, there was a bit to go. Well, no, I mean, the, thought there was a the bit key, to go. The, for me, the you know the, the key thing that was going to um, have have a bounce in the share price was going to be um, the mining lease um, being signed off. So I was waiting for that mm. to happen, and obviously that wasn't happening. And there were, I guess, reasons why you know that wasn't happening. Um, and yeah, I missed my opportunity. So you know, I've I've learned a lot. You know, I've definitely would take some of that um, cash off the table um, if I had my chance again. Of interest, did you buy into Leo Lithium? Uh, I wasn't in Leo. I was in um, Lion Town. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And at what point, so they they enter trading halt. Um, you know, you, you're you following the forums, you're following Twitter. Although, why is there such a big ABZ Twitter crowd? Like, like you must, they must have the biggest Twitter like Aussies love a punt. Specific we love a punt, crowd. right? And so bigger was, than the Greatland Gold yeah, ones. Were, were, <laughs> way bigger. <laughs> yeah, there were plenty of punters involved in, in, in AVZ, right? So yeah. I think it, it you know, it, it, drew was, that a, it crowd. was a big punter stock, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah. And and then like what like like what information are you reading as it's in halt and that halt sort of dragging on? It, have you got any indication that uh, this period of limbo is kind of gonna have a finite 
time to it or are you sort of are you like what are you what yeah, are you so thinking about, and feeling? I mean about a year ago they did a road show actually and I went to the one in in Sydney and um and Nigel, Nigel Ferguson the the CEO um, got up and spoke and um it was an open forum we all asked you know a lot of questions and and Sorry was this before or after they'd gone into suspension after, after. after maybe yeah, six months or so after suspensions because yep. you know a lot of shareholders are wondering you know what's going on um and that kind of gave me some renewed confidence that you know they had they had their shit together and and, and there was going to be was going to be a resolution but then obviously after that fact then they went to um uh, is it the ICC or, or you know the the, the arbitration court. arbitration yeah. um, courts and stuff and and um you know the shit really started to hit the fan I guess mm. Mm. and, and we're, we're sitting here today we've talked about ABZ a couple of times and I think like, you know, there's a lot of nuance to the story because it's um, the intersection of corporate governance, geopolitical um, warfare in some ways, for, you know, nationalization of, of, uh, of, of, of assets. Um, there's a whole bunch of factors going in there and retail is kind of tight. Retail shareholders are really tied in amongst it. Um, you shared with us that you actually had, had written a letter to the Australian government as like, like recently as July of this year? Yeah, Department what, of Foreign Affairs, yeah. What was what was your line of questioning to, to DFAT? Look, I was just, I just wanted to know whether, first of all, whether they were involved, uh, that, you know, whether they knew about the, the arbitration proceedings, um, if they were having conversations with, um, uh, with AVZ themselves, because obviously AVZ were being pretty tight-lipped um, around what was, you know, what was going on. Um, and then, you know, what support that they, um, they could provide because when you look at it on a on a global scale it's a globally significant resource it's a critical mineral and the other side of it is 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 that it's it's going to fall into chinese hands and there's a bit of a you know there's a a, a, a bit of a um conflict now happening between between you know the west and and, and china in terms of um who's going to who's going to have um security of supply uh so i would have thought that you know this would be on their radar and something they would need be needing to pay close attention to. We, we've actually seen mm. Ferb say no to the sale of an ASX company to a Chinese entity with an asset in the Congo. It was it was AVZ back in the day. It wasn't I don't know if it was a sale necessarily, but I think it was investment in the at the company level. This is when Ferb were at their most. Um, yeah, they would higher sort of powers in the period of COVID, and I think I think there was a decision to block yeah. an investment at the company level greater than 20%. Which clearly shows that they, they had interest in, you know, Australian yeah. companies with assets overseas, which, I mean, yeah. the whole premise is, is pretty intriguing as to the the sort of rights that sit around a, yeah. a project in a foreign country, but that's a whole other thing, right? Yeah, and it, people who've sort of been reading the media about the story, like Tom, Tom Richardson at the AFR has been, um, a, a dominant voice, I think, in the traditional media kind of landscape talking about AV, AVZ. Amongst the retail shareholders, Tom Richardson is not held in very high regard. Can you talk talk to us about that dynamic between AVZ shareholders and Tom Richardson's what? writing? I mean, I just don't, I don't know, I, I can't understand where he's coming from and why he's um, choosing to present it in, in, in that manner. Um, it, it doesn't really... What, what manner is he sort of articulating? Just... Well, he's been very, um, very negative towards, um, towards I guess, um, the role that AVZ played in, um, in how this has all unfolded. And, you know, this is still an arbitration. We're, we're still yet to find, find out the outcome. But f from a shareholder perspective, it looks like we've been doing the right things um, and we haven't just thrown, you know, paper bags around to try and, you know, secure mining licences. And part of the resources been stolen from us. Um, we had first right of refusal on that and that wasn't given to us. And then just recently, um, uh, Zygen have said that they, they've, they've got ownership of the of the Northern Block, which um, AVZ have got rights to. So this this whole kind of, you know, are you going to play by the rules or, or, or are you just going to, you know, do what you want? And, and, and the way that the AFR are, are kind of um, responding on it is, is, is kind of, you know, I, I, I don't think looking at it from from the perspective, from AVZ's perspective, and it, it just seemed a bit biased. And I, it's there's, confusing there's a to me. There's pure focus yeah. on the corporate governance, like yeah. downfalls, without 
without having a conversation about the broader context of the geopolitical yeah uh, and that's a big story right yeah, and that's yeah. that's a big that's a big story yeah um and that's what, a very what, big story you sort of touched on corruption and the issue of cor- corruption in this story what did you make of the um the hiring of this guy marius um i'm forgetting his last name he was a agent in in the congo that was gave him a million dollars or something so avz paid him us one million with an option of up to five million dollars if certain uh objectives were achieved what as a shareholder did you make of of that i mean part of me is like you've got to be realistic about you know where you're investing and how you're going to get things done over there and things aren't necessarily done you know Completely conventionally, yeah, completely conventionally, <laughs> and like I, you know, I actually raised my hand, you know, at this at this uh, shareholder get together and was like, "What's it going to cost to get this done?" Because you know we've been trying to do things the right way. Do we just do things the way that's going to get it done? Um, and you know, to to the management's credit, they said, "Absolutely not." Like we've got to play this with a straight bat. You know, like they've got DLA Piper in there. You know, um, very well renowned law firm. You know, acting on their behalf. So I, like. I, I can't see the ruling not being in our favour, but just because the ruling's in our favour doesn't mean that we're going to get the right result because they'll just create another company or the DRC government will just say, well, if you, I'm not going to do it. Like it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that that will get the right end result, meaning that we'll get the mining licence, we'll, you know, the trading halt will be lifted and, and, and we'll be able to, um, you know, Sell our shares if we want to. Well, yeah. But even if they if they rule in your favour, yeah, and the halt is lifted, imagine what's going to happen to the share well, price. Oh, we said, and, and that was raised. We said you cannot you cannot um, list, uh, lift this trading halt unless you've got all your ducks in a row because yeah. this thing's so going to be you're happy for it to stay yeah. into yeah, in it's, suspension. Yeah, it's got to stay in suspension until, until the mining license is granted. Everything's you know everything's you know, sorted out and stitched up. Otherwise, well, more, the, more the, own, the ownership. Ownership. Like, like is yeah. what mm. what is Zijin's role? Like, and, and, I and guess, can they have a role? Because would you want would you want them to have yeah. any role now? It's like you mm. know, if someone sleeps with your wife, you don't invite them over for breakfast. Like, <laughs> <laughs> unless you're in a swingers club, maybe. <laughs> but uh, anyway, that's a whole other area of the world. What, um, do you, what do you make of the um the AGM dynamics at the moment? So. I think the notice of meeting is up. I haven't read it myself, but I understand that there's mm. like 20 odd nominations for directors. There's a handful of directors that have been part of a campaign to make Monono great again. Um, and they appear to be organized in a way that seems as if they have hired proxy advisors to, to be part of that campaign. Um, like, as I understand that the retail shareholders of AV said, a look at these three nominations in particular and sort of, you know, think there's an alternative agenda at play that they're not yeah. being transparent about. Where do you yeah. sit on that? Yeah, 100%. Like, I mean, you, we can't get rid of, you know, the current management at this point in time. Like, we're, we're too far down that road. And, yeah, I do think that, you know, their um, their agenda is, um, you know, is, is is aligned to the Chinese and to, 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 to take the asset off us. So we've, got to, we've just got to stay the course. And I think you'll find that... Um, you know the voting will will show that. Mm. And so okay, so we've we've did done the episodes on bloody the whole, you know, the ownership structure and how it's gone between Dathmir, Dath, Dathmir, Dathcom, AVZ, Common Air, Zijin. Um, right, give us the update of where it's at now and where you think it's going to end up in the ownership. Of, of, did you are you saying before that you pretty much can't have Zijin in at all, or like how is this? going to play out i'm uh, i'm not too sure like uh, obviously they're gonna the, they're gonna rule in favor well not obviously but the hope is that they rule in favor and that um the 15 percent um avz have first right of refusal on then yep. what do we pay for that i don't know like zijin paid 35 million or something like that so that'd be pretty good buying at the current <laughs> that'd be not a, price. So, not a bad deal yeah, would so, it? i mean yeah. there's i mean there's there's so much to be like still to be worked through, but I just don't know how you can have a have those two parties ever working together. Yeah, you know, like it just it, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, from what, from my perspective, what, what what I think will happen was is that um, well, the DRC government's really got to decide whether they want foreign investment or not outside of China. So if if they if they want that, then they will have to. 
um, they'll have to kind of um, enact whatever whatever ruling comes down um, <clears throat> from the arbitration proceedings. And then I feel like if the Chinese want the asset, which it's clear they do, they'll probably lob a takeover bid. And I dare say, you know, shareholders would probably be open to that because our our, our cash has been tied up for you know mm. for that long. That that that's probably the that's probably the, the best possible outcome. Whether we get there or not, I don't know. Because if it if it goes as you say, if it if it if it comes out of a trading hole, even if they have got a few things, nice people, discovery. Pe- pe- people yeah. are gonna oh, people are gonna, gonna be destroyed. people are gonna dump it. You know, it's not it's yeah. what two and a half billion dollar market cap. It's not going to be worth that. Uh, you yeah. know, at, at but, four o'clock when the markets close. But if you use if you use Leo Lithium as an example, so their obviously their problems come about from the Mali government, so they're the ones. But that was a so you got Leo Lithium and Ganfan working together. So well, I wouldn't say it, their issues have come about from the Mali government but, necessarily. It's come about from what happened at Firefinch that Leo have been tied in with. But the latest latest stuff was from the Mali. Yeah. government ownership so that's where that sort of come in but like the I, I suppose that's an example where you could have the Congolese government AVZ and Zijin like it's a, but then it's Mali to Congo might be a bit different mm-hmm. but that I suppose that's an example where you got Chinese ASX listed and African government working together yeah do you think that's not a possibility for AVZ oh it could be yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I mean I'm not I'm not close enough to like the intricacies of that to kind of really comment in, in, yeah. in too great detail. Like as a, you know, as a shareholder, I'm, I'm open to to any option that really en- enables mm. us to trade again and 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 to realize the value. Of reala- it. Realize right. you know, realize the value. But it, it, I think you look at like the fact of why the Congo is the Congo. You look at the AVZ deposit. You look at you know a lot of the gold bonds there. Like remember Sundance, yeah. Sundance for the, the iron ore over there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Cobalt, like a lot that, of arbitration. The, the corruption <laughs> is yeah. a function of how rich all the ore bodies are over there. Like they're obviously you can just see, you can the see ore bodies are that good, which is what is the corruption drama. is a function of. Yeah, you can see Robert Friedland as well with Kamoa Kakula. What. It, the proportion of the asset that had to be given away, and there's joint Chinese, American, and Congolese government interest in this thing. And from, you know, where it was to actually getting into production, that ownership tr- structure changed massively, you know. So, yeah. yeah. But that's an operating mine now, one of the richest copper mines in the world. And you got, and you, there's examples like you, we got Kabali, um, which is Barrick. Barrick. Um, yep. That's like, there's examples of where it, where it does work, but they've obviously been going for a lot longer and I think I obviously say the opportunity for new projects I look at PNG with new projects over there with Wafi Gulpu and everything the always go back yeah. to PNG <laughs> go back to PNG but it's like the new ones they're like right we can't leverage as much off the old ones but we can really take a good chunk of these new ones and it has been yeah. fascinating to see the US government become more switched on to what the Chinese were switched on to 10 years ago with the One Belt One Road initiative yeah. and start to think hey maybe we need to have a bit more sway and put a bit more investment in african nations so we'll see if that goes anywhere yeah but ben it's been uh, great to hear the story what, from an abz holder is there anything we don't know that like you know we've there's a lot of oh, <laughs> so, no, so much sorry is there there's anything so we don't know that you know nah no ah. nah, nah, you i mean you need to be able to you should try and get a uh, Get, get the lawyer on from DLA Piper on the show. <laughs> he, he would. I mean, you could almost make a movie out of you know what's going on here. Like, I'd love. Oh, I'd love to be a fly on the wall. GameStop. There'll have to be one about AVZ. So you yeah. think so? Yeah. Oh, hey, movie production boys. <laughs> Do you guys see the movie <laughs> Gold? Yeah, yeah, I watched yeah, it the other night yeah. with Bros for the first yeah. time. Yeah, that's yeah. wild. Yeah, yeah, Bree X. Yeah, hell of a story. Yeah. All right. but did they did they say in that movie they were sprinkling the gold on there? Yeah. Or they, mm, they yeah. yeah, I remember watching it, but I wasn't it's as not in a the great movie. Then. Like from a movie, yeah, it's pretty horrible. They, they could have done a better job. Then he gets a big bag it's of a good cash. Story, at the end. but the, the movie was pretty average. He gets, yeah. no, he got the check at the end, didn't he? The old yep. mate mailed yeah. him the check. Half half of it, yeah. It was mailed to him from Mike to Guzman. They didn't call him Mike to Guzman in the movie. It was Mike something else. But yeah. um, but yeah. The story, the, the story Mike, behind it is incredible. The real Mike de Guzman is still alive in the Philippines, according to Warren. Irwin. Yeah, ask Warren Irwin. <laughs> <laughs> is, awesome. he pretty, is he pretty confident? Yeah. He's, he's, he's had mates have seen him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know a guy. 
Ah, cheers, man. Awesome. Hey, we'll, um, hey, we've got you by the balls now. So anytime <laughs> ABZ comes up, we're, uh, <laughs> we're, we're, we'll be drinking you straight up, Cobber. Wicked. Appreciate no. it, Ben. You're up, Kingsley. Cheers. Like, Thanks, Jeez, mate. mate. All good. Good on you. Oh, how good's this, mate? Oh, we were just mate, eating we're lunch and we... Just, this is, I reckon, JD's man crush. He's just rocked <laughs> up. Kingsley Jones. Mate, an ex-guest. How are you, mate? We've got you in the flesh this time. I'm really good. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Man, so, um, yeah, yeah, I'm doing great. Um, obviously, I just ran into the guys whilst having some lunch. Oh, which is a pleasant surprise. Yeah, mate, it's you great can't to be show here. your face around us. If, like, <laughs> if we, if we, especially if we want you to come on. There's plenty that will show their face that we don't want to come <laughs> on. Oh, you're highly selective. That's what I like highly to hear. Highly selective, mate. It's, like, it's, mate. it's like running a fund with high conviction. <laughs> yeah, awesome. You've got 10 picks and you've got to be bloody confident on it. So for, people, for people wondering who we've got here, we've got yeah. Kingsley Jones. He's the, the founder of Jevons Global. So we interviewed Kingsley God, th three months or so yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Now. We've been that, yeah. it, was a, it was a cracking interview. Yep. A lot of sort of timeless aspects to it. So go back and enjoy that one. Yeah. I had my, my cousin, cousin Joel, who uh, you guys know, he listened to that episode and he's like, I would give all of my money to Kingsley. I just trust. He <laughs> <laughs> can take my money. Yeah, Here's the number. Not, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he, um, he listened to that episode and he just, he, he heard alignment between, you know, his initial views and kind of what you echoed in an eloquent way. Um, you've got, mate, you're a fascinating guy to be. Um, following the mining investment scene, given the fact that, you know, um, you, you've got less facial hair than anyone in the industry and you, and you live in Canberra. Uh, so, and you, That's right. And you don't say swear words like us. So, um, but with us- Mate Kingsley, you'd be proud. I'm cutting back to about one or two an episode. On, <laughs> on, on growing as an individual. I've used the two up already. So you say for- Your quota's done. Yeah. Kingsley, we- um. We touched on an article you wrote recently in yeah. our conversation with Rusty on metal price bifurcation. And you'd done this fascinating deep dive into Linus and where Linus's product actually goes. Why don't you, why don't you talk a bit about that and what the, what the findings were on that one? Just reread the article if you need to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, sure. So maybe a little bit of context first for anyone who's listening in. So um, I, I think with Linus, as we know, they're the biggest um, rare earths producer outside of China. At, at least in terms of separated products. Um, if you're just talking concentrate, they'd be MP, but they don't, mm. they send it all separate. to China for processing. Anyway, so, yeah. so when, when you think about that, you know, Linus therefore is a bit of a litmus test as to who's the buyer, right? Yeah. And if you're interested in bringing a new mine on, you're going to want to know who those potential buyers are because uh, you've got to get the offtake. And the, ba the, the banks times. need to know in order to... Everyone needs yeah. to know. Yeah, yeah. You, you need to know, right? Yeah. And if you don't have confidence in where the buyers are, you're going to waste a lot of time knocking on doors where you know they just don't have the cash or the interest to buy. So, so my, we can see a few of these you know rare earth developers yeah. who who are trying to bring a project online. Yeah. But and they're going through these complicated debt finance processes and they seemingly get stuck there. They you know Arafura Hastings. Oh, yeah. There's a bunch of you know want to be rare earth producers who seem who are seemingly stuck That's i mean right. i mean the, the exception stuck being being, being like luca right and they mm. they they got the free kick from the government to yeah. sort of develop that rare earth yeah. i mean all yeah. luca has to do now yeah. once they build the thing is the find the buy exactly yeah <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah. yeah. they don't have the offtake yeah. but that's the that's yeah. the deal yeah uh, do you we, we chatted to dylan kelly from terra capital on our little rare earth spectacular and he's sort of he's Pretty much first rule was sticking with the incumbents. Are you a bit the same in the rare earths space? Yeah, definitely off the back of that Linus deep dive. So let's just share why. I mean, when I did the, the deep dive on Linus, uh, obviously they don't disclose that information. They'll tell you top line revenue. They'll tell you how many tons of, of, of rare earth um, oxides are produced. Um, but, they, but they won't tell you where they go or who the buyer is, okay? Um, so I, that was what I was interested in because we do know that, uh, you know, they... Uh, were financed out of Japan. Yep. So we know that Japan's a crucial market. Uh, but if we look at the trade data, and that's what I did in the article, I, I went to the uh, United Nations Comtrade database. Um, I tried to use the Australian trade data to figure out where the rare earths went. Uh, but unfortunately, the Australian trade data is censored. So it light just disappears from it. <laughs> yeah, right. So you don't see the exports. But, but we know that their plant is in Malaysia. So if you went to Malaysia, fortunately, they don't censor it. <laughs> so you can see the imports see. coming in. And then, of course, um, given that the Malaysians are also showing you the exports, uh, you can see to which countries uh, the finished product is going. Okay, So it's just a case of, of putting those puzzle pieces together. Um, and then you know we, we find out, uh, for instance, that the biggest markets um, 
for Linus's product in terms of where they deliver it is actually China, which mm. is probably a Japanese company in China, mm. right? Geographically, it's going to China, but a lot of the Japanese have their factories in China to save mm. cost. Um, so China's the biggest market, and then it's, um, I think it's, uh, depending on the material, it's, it's you know, Taiwan, um, Vietnam, uh, and Japan. Mm. Uh, and US is only 1.2%. <laughs> is yeah. that all? Wow. And, and, and this insight, like, in your, from, from your purview, why is this insight an important one when we think about the rare earth sort of investment landscape? I think the most important thing is that figure for the US is only 1.2%. Because we already know that MP Materials is mining a lot of material. So you could ask the question, why aren't they selling it to Americans or why aren't they building a plant in the United States? Well, it's because the nature of US demand at this point in time is that they have virtually no magnet production at all. So remember the, the high value neodymium, praseodymium products is the one that you need for the, for the magnets, that and the, the terbium and dysprosium. And, and the US, um, by all accounts, has only got about 100 tonnes of manufacture mm. in a global 200,000 tonne a year market. Mm. So that's why it's important. So we've got to find anyone who's out there trying to build a mine, we've got to find where the real buyers are. We know they're in Japan. We know they're in China. It looks like some of those plants are in Vietnam. It looks like some of those plants are in Thailand. And it looks increasingly, from announcements, like some of them will be in South Korea. Mm. And what are the, what are the implications for the funding and the, the project that Linus is going to build downstream in Texas? From yeah, yeah. So they, remember they got that money. I forget the number. Department of Defense. Big, yeah. Two, yeah. 200 Do you guys know? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Yeah. So around that, that mark. It was lower before and then it got bigger. Um, you know, I'm trying to figure that one out. Um, obviously, you don't get the US Department of Defense uh, kicking $200, $300 million for no reason, yeah? You know, they're mm. not, not crazy. Um, they're not going to just spend it on nothing. Um, but we think what's going on there is that the U.S. is trying to get organize itself, at least in terms of defense demand, which is yeah. not big, right? It's small. It's small. It might be a few thousand tons. Yeah. But I think they're thinking, because I don't read minds, I think their thinking is if we can get a 1,000, 2,000 ton plant up, that's the start, right? Okay. And then you establish yeah. you can do it. The focus there was on the heavy rare earths from memory that's as well, right. which is the DYTB. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, yeah, that a hundred percent. And and we think that, you know, it's very, very difficult to tease out information. Fortunately, because it's so much a topic of discussion, uh, there are now a number of reports coming out from US agencies, you know, Department of Energy, uh, Department of Defense and so on, where they do a supply chain study. So we're trying to work out what we can glean from that. But I think that fundamentally what's going on is this is driven by the US Navy. Is, is it pretty similar to, I guess, your lithium downstream processing, your EV, um, EV manufacturing? Like, is it the same function of cheaper to do it over China? They've got more oh, expertise yeah. in it now. Are, right. they, are they and they've have they developed a competitive advantage in magnets like they're starting to in EV and downstream processing? I, I think so. Fundamentally, um, the, what what makes Japan so important? is, um, you know, the ancient history is um, these magnets, the Nidami and Feriboron ones, you know, they were first invented in the US and Japan simultaneously around 1983. Mm. But it was the Japanese that invented the kind that's most relevant today, the so-called sintered magnet. Sintered so, magnets, yeah. Yeah, so, so the Japanese sintered magnets, um, they, the Japanese, they still have kind of like the technological edge. You know, they're still producing the most advanced ones, but the Chinese have caught up. Much. Is this is this a potential for Japan to really take off with the whole the IRA and IRA and dechinering things? Is this going to? I think Japan, so. Has Japan got a potential to become like not another China? But do they, do they have a free trade agreement? With, they, they, don't. They, they don't. No, you, you, sorry. South Korea does, but Japan doesn't. No, yes. that's yeah, what I thought. Yeah, 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 they yeah. don't. Yeah. But hey, I'll say Japan don't have free trade with America. No, yeah. they're yeah. very much in their yeah. interest. But too. I think they're going to do like a side deal. Yeah. yeah, you know, like not like a full free trade deal, but say, hang on, for this stuff, let's pretend we got one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm. a, fr a free magnet trade agreement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right Kingsley, if I uh, remember correctly, we did a, uh, a pretty yeah. juicy underrated, overrated section at the end of our last interview, and you were one of the first people that was actually able to answer that in one word. So <laughs> credit to you. We just spoke with your wife and, and she said, it's the first time Kingsley's ever been succinct. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, done, and done what he's told. <laughs> <laughs> he's had a chance to live with it. <laughs> <laughs> and one of, the, one of the ones 
I, I believe you're testing my memory here, but I believe you said it was underrated was Azua Minerals. At, oh yeah, at a buck, I think. Yeah, so, mm. uh, maybe it's shade over, but yeah, around there. Yeah. yeah. So, have, have you sort of been a shareholder throughout, and you get any yeah, thoughts you've been on a share, I've been buying and and you know was participating in the capital raise, and then had a bit of a slump, so we bought a bit more. Um, the the only sad thing here is obviously it's under under bid now, um, at at um, three fifty three fifty two, depending on which which of the two deals it is. Um, but we we wound up uh, so, selling into that just because. Um, mm. Uh, I don't think there'll be sufficient deal tension to get another bidder in to get it up above that level. And as oh, we all know, throwing a third in there, far out. Well, exactly. wouldn't that make things interesting? You don't yeah. need a third, all you need is Gina. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing, and everyone knows. Well, Gina's, the, the, Gina's yeah. number two. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Gina's number. Yeah, exactly. I, so I, did, yeah, I read we, your article yeah. Um, where you, yeah, where you articulated. I suppose a, a potential. Um, fear around a, a FERB rejection yep. of, of SQM, and I think the, the underlying tone was like, you know, what's the potential of political influence in this in this decision? Um, yep. And and um, we, when the the day of the Azua bid came out, we had uh, Ben Bailey of Harvest Lane, so they run an M and A arbitrage right. strategy there, super well versed in the yep. p- um, machinations of um, of of mergers and acquisitions. I sent him a link to your article and I, and I asked for his, because in, in our interview oh, yeah. with, with Ben, he said that, um, he basically said, I think a FERB rejection would be unlikely. Yep. Um, and then he went on to talk about, you know, yes. the dynamics of the risk reward for, yep. for investors at that point in time. I'm going to read out Ben's, um, yep, Ben's response because I think you'd be fine with me doing that. Yep, absolutely. Ben, he said, Flawed, if Gina understands that FERB will just interfere, then there's no need to wade into market at the bid price for a blocking stake and then immediately lose 30% when a deal breaks. She'd just wait and pick up 20% afterwards at a lower price. It also assumes that Gina can just offer a lower price and shareholders accept willingly if it's a bad price, shareholders aren't going to take it. SQM has an existing presence in Australia via HJV, covalent with West Farmers. CapEx has been sunk by covalent upstream at Mount Holland and the downstream with the multi-billion dollar Granada refinery. It's the exact type of track record of investing in country that you want to see from a foreign bidder. From memory, the Granada refinery still needs billions to get up and running. So uh, blocking the AZS deal might also put that separate investment at risk. Why would SQM subsequently tip in more money in? As for Tianchi being a 23% shareholder of SQM, they already have a controlling 51% stake in TLEA JV with IGO. TLEA tried to buy Essential earlier in the year. Not trying to suggest Ferb is a home run or that Kingsley doesn't have some valid points. It's just that I don't see this bidder as a logical starting point to stick the middle finger up at China. Did you get all that, Kingsley? Yeah, I did. <laughs> and, and, and let me say, firstly, I mean, they're well-considered points. And I, I think the, the key message of my article is, is not that I think there's anything wrong with SQM as a bidder. I don't. Uh, we actually own SQM in our portfolio. Um, and I, I think in my article, I was trying to make the point that um, I've got no objections to this deal moving forward. We've been an, a, an, an Azure Minerals shareholder from around the buck level. Uh, and obviously extremely happy with Tony Rivera and his team. Um, very happy that SQM actually entered the fray after getting that initial stake. You remember the one where they took 19.99 very early. Um, so very happy about all of that. So as I pointed out in my article, why the hell are we making this fuss? It's simply because um, in the way this deal is structured, there's not a lot of upside to staying within that, you know, the, the company um, because when you see Gina come in with that 18% stake she's already built, people are remembering the Liontown incident and they're fearing that there's a possibility um, that there will be that 20, 30% retracement on Pro- the price. Probably probability is the, uh, yep. oh, bro, no, in terms of Gina getting involved, it's a more it's more probable than possible these days, isn't it? Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the problem. Now, the reason I wrote the article is um, you can see that, you can observe it, we can see what's happened to Liontown. Um, if people were to ask me, Kingsley, what are you going to do with the money that you just realized from the transaction? I'd be happy to tell them I'm going to put it into Liontown <laughs> yeah. at a lower mm. price. That's what I'm really talking about is that when you have all of this speculation about what FERB will or will not do, what Gina will or will not do, whether the government has a de facto ban on Chinese investment and how far that goes, does the, does the government of the day... Um, have a, an unofficially announced policy intention um, to um, oppose investment by either Chinese companies or companies in some way connected with China uh, in in our own mineral projects. Mm. 
that's what bothers me. So the best way I know to handle that is to make the point that it bothers me. Mm. <laughs> have, have, have you seen many examples? Can you compare many examples to where how this Azure deal has been structured yeah. purely to be uh, deter one single investor? That's the first time I've ever seen it. Yeah, it's uh, isn't it? Oh, we have how, how the ISX deals are working at the moment purely because of Gina Rana. <laughs> Well, yeah, and it's interesting, and I don't want to get into that in, into a specific discussion of, of um, you know, Gina's intentions and all the rest of it. I think what I was trying to say in my article is that I've not seen that before. I think perhaps it draws attention to a few lo loopholes in our takeover rules that you could even consider doing that, like what happened with the broken Lion Town deal. Yeah. Because uh, you know, as I think the gentleman who was responding to my article that you Bailey, shared, that, yeah. yeah. Um, as he was pointing out, there's there's nothing, there's no reason to question SQM's bona fides. This is an absolute quality bidder yeah. for AZS with a track record of money and country at execution. And I would say that's also true of Abu Mali. Uh, but let's remember Abu Mali got frightened out of the line tap. But, they, but mm. they effectively, Abu Mali effectively were offering a takeover at 100% yeah. premium because the undisturbed price is what, fifty. Yes. And, the, and instead of yes. buying on market, they were just putting numerous bids yes. in behind closed doors that yeah. weren't getting disclosed. I think the analog is, is like a, there's a competition angle in all of this. Right. And, you know, mining, we rarely ever really talk about um, competition regulators because it's, yes. but there's there's absolutely like, what what's the strategy here? It's to prevent, prevent competition from actually emerging and, you yeah. know, like you know, like it's basically, can we hoard the rocks? Well, this is what I think. Can we hoard the rocks so that no one else bloody creates the business that I'm I want yeah, to build? And I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, that's, a, that's a competition argument. The competition regulator is pretty active in other ways, but definitely not exploration projects, right? I mean, yeah. And for mining, where, um, yeah, it's not like the it's it's a ubiquitous thing. There's deposits everywhere, but it's it's a, I think it's a competition oh, argument. I think it's a great take, and that's why, you know, if if you will, I mean, people if the people read my live wire category, they realise as I say. I'm basically writing it because I'm peeved with the government not being clear about what their intentions are with all this signaling about, about mm. China. But the reason I'm saying that is just what you picked up, is that if we don't have the deal tension between bidders, yeah? Mm. You know, what, how, how is it that, that, that Gina can come in, accumulate 18% visibly on market, on the bid, massive volume at 350, and not have the price go to the moon by people just naturally assuming, well, she's she's actually going to have a crack at offering a better, better price. price. Yeah, there's no better price here, so that tells you that this is really a game situation. You know, pe people are playing out the game theory. Of it. Do you do, do you think by, by the way that Gene is doing it? Yep. And you put that alongside the way that Chris Ellison's doing things taking minority, these 15 to 20% stakes without yep. having to pay a premium for the remaining 80%. They're paying a premium for that yep. 15 to 20. Yep. Is that an indication that same strategy, that lithium superco prophecy might come true and they are aligned with each other? Uh, potentially. I mean, I'm not close enough to... Uh, you, you know, got his number? Ah. <laughs> just, uh, I, I'm not close enough to Secret the, safe to here, the talk. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I seriously don't know. But um, what I will say about it, let's, let's just take the personalities out of it. Um, the point that I keep making is that if you eliminate deal tension by saying some parties are not welcome at the table, yeah? If you do that politically, then you're likely to create a situation where the Australian industry will realise lower prices mm. for their projects. And how is that rewarding to an exploration team? It's not. You know, they're getting a worse outcome. And that's my fear. I'm not saying that's the situation we're in, but that's why I wrote the article. I, I'm trying to warn people from my perspective, don't let that happen. Yeah, but Can, all the international companies like <laughs> Albemarle and SQM that are putting these bids in, that, that, you know, shareholders are going to make good coin out of that. Oh, yeah. But uh, this whole, you know, Gina and Chris Ellison taking these minority controls, uh, shareholders aren't making money out of that. They're not. Look at Delta. Yep. Delta's gone exactly. from 90 down to 60. Yeah, they're not, um, and not yet. Yeah. But things could change, right? Like, things could change. Yeah. But, yeah, at but the, yeah, at the moment, yeah. their uh, shareholders are probably losing out a bit by all this. Yeah. Uh, well, that's my way they're doing too. It. Yeah. yeah. Kingsley, while we've got you, yeah, I want to pick your brain on a couple other issues. So we spoke about iron ore and sort of higher cost, you yeah. know, fringe iron ore plays when we last spoke with you. And 
geopolitically, quite a bit has happened in, in the past three months. You know, there's a lot going on in the Chinese property market. Mm. You know, the stimulation hasn't been as strong as a lot of market participants may have thought. In China, mm. they're facing a lot of demographic issues. That's not necessarily to new. I interview with Anthony Kavanagh and mm. he explains the, why they're so negative sort of iron ore based on the, the, the Chinese demographic shape yeah. and, and, and what, the, what that's going to do to kind of demand for it, which yeah. is uh, yeah, super fascinating. And from our discussion with Kingsley three months ago, the one of the premises was that the the sort of floor iron ore price was a lot higher than many people perhaps yeah. had in mind. That's my view, yeah. How has that thesis changed at all in the past three months or anything else you're seeing from China that we should be switched on to? No, there isn't from my side. And and what I will say is that I think demand's been a little higher than people expected, but I think the reason for that is just that there's a compositional change going on in China for demand. So it, it, it's definitely true that construction's the largest share of it. But ju just to give you some sort of background numbers, um, I believe in the United States, um, the largest demand source for steel in the United States, which is a small market, you know, it's only 100, 100, 100 plus million tonnes, uh, as opposed to China, which is you know, massive. Um, but it's about 44% of steel goes to autos. Okay. Um, so that should give you some context is, you know, you know in, in a mature market, what you tend to see is construction is, is not as big, um, but, but a lot of manufacturers can still use a lot of steel. Now, we have to recognize that, um, you know, 44% of a 100 million ton market is only, you know, 44 odd million tons. Mm. Um, and China is, what, a billion or something? Um, so, so auto demand alone won't get you there. But let's realize that Chinese auto production is twice that of the US. Mm. And its population is four times higher. How about e EVs? Do they not use a bit more aluminium? Uh, aluminium they do. To be more lightweight? For lightweight in, yeah. yeah. No, they do. But, but I think the, the key point that I'm trying to make is that as China continues to leverage its manufacturing prowess, um, what we will likely see is more thing, you know, just more demand for things like wind turbines for steel factories for, you know, I use the example of autos for trucks and so on. It won't be enough to offset, um, you know, decline in construction demand completely. Um, but at the same time, what we're seeing is further exports of Chinese steel into their Belt and Road projects and other things in the emerging markets. So I think there's a, you know, there's a little bit of a trade-off here. I'm not saying that this is a growth market, it's not, um, but I don't see any fundamental reason why it's gonna collapse, is my main point. And you also had some interesting takes on gallium and germanium. And since then, we've seen some interesting, to sort of say the least, action from yep. the Chinese on graphite just, just uh, in the yeah. last week. Yeah. I'm sure you've got a, a take. Were you on Oh, no. I had a look and foolishly, I, I wasn't in the stock before that happened. Oh, you know, it, no, it rapidly I, I, went down into intraday yeah. Uh, yeah. on the last day of the squeeze. Well, Far out. Amazing. Yeah. Anyway, but, sorry, sorry to rub salt. No, in the wound. No, no. <laughs> rub salt in the wound if you weren't in on it. No, no, but, 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 the, 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 but these are all good points, right? Is yeah. that, is that um, what I will say about that is um, rather, you know, my attitude is well, if, if China wants to curtail exports of synthetic graphite, that's great for everybody else because that's been the threat to pricing in the market. Yeah, um, so it's not a bad thing for for non-Chinese companies. Yeah, mate. What uh, everyone's, uh, for whatever reason, especially, they should not be asking me for stock tips uh, in <laughs> at this conference. And everyone's like, "What's catching your eye on the market?" I'm like, "But it'd be better for me to ask you, and then I repeat those to all these people that come up to me." <laughs> what's uh, what's catching your eye at the moment outside of the uh, you know the landscape that we've talked about? Where do you see some uh, maybe some counter cyclical opportunities? Yeah, yeah. Uh, like okay. you, you like it. What's junior gold look like to you at the moment? Uh, that's that's the place we're starting to do a lot more work. Yeah, yeah. And look, uh, what's what do we class as junior? Uh, look, I, I think that um, yeah. okay. Let's let's take Victorian gold fields. Um, yep. I think Southern Cross Gold with that great hit they had a yep. couple of weeks ago. Three hundred and thirty odd yep. meters at six grams. Yeah. 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 Obviously, it's veined, veiny, veiny yeah. game. Yeah, it is. Um, but you know, you've you've got a couple of players in there like S two, which. Are, uh, yep. They've only just really gotten their approvals to go drill after all these years. Yeah. S2 um, won, there was a tender of sort of some of that Victoria Goldfields yeah. and S2 with a lucky winner, but there are a bunch of companies that, that wanted oh, that yeah. ground, right? Yeah. 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 No, so I, th I think that, 
everyone's kind of had gold off the you know off the scope, right? Yep. Um, but in these circumstances, with you know the possibly persistent inflation, uh, you know people tell me about crypto. I'm not a crypto fan, but you know it's there. It's not going to go away. But but what I say to them is that when you're in a semiconductor war, and the value of crypto depends on computing power, I don't think it's going to be a fascinating reserve asset for anybody who's been sanctioned on the availability of computing power. Yeah. <laughs> They're going to want something different. Maybe something old-fashioned like gold. So they'll be fighting over they'll be fighting over uh, semiconductors and magnets, and then uh, which, but then that's going to help gold because they're fighting. I think so. <laughs> like, but well, that's, that's what that's what will happen. Gold does super well in periods of um, of, 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 heightened, of yeah, heightened, heightened tension, geopolitical unrest. Yeah, so it's that's. Yeah. But then, okay. So how do you approach these junior gold companies in in the sense of, okay. You know they they've been beaten to a pulp yeah. essentially. Yeah. There's they will in some point in the future turn around. Yeah. But how do you time the investment, knowing that they're going to likely have to raise one or two more times before that turnaround? If the turnaround does elongate, yeah. how do you approach it from an investment? Do you go and now? Do you wait for the wait for the placement deals? Like. I or think do you take that, a few bites yeah, of the no, cherry. They're, they're, they're great questions. I think all of the above. You always taking a few bites of the cherry is a good idea. H having having a good district understanding is really important, mm. because from an investor interest point of view, gold has not been front and center for a while. Okay, so if you go back totally. to you know the Hemi discovery, that that really yeah. ignited interest in in that district. Um, yeah. I, I think that um, it's early days yet, but Southern Cross Gold. As you know, there's a couple of theories about about that whole gold belt um, and two different forms of deposit. And Southern Cross Gold feels that they have the different kinds, the kind that uh, has similar attributes to the Fosterville discovery. We don't know that yet. Um, but I think when you get that sort of story in the market, um, coupled with some drilling success, mm. coupled with the, the actual spot price of the commodity moving north, that's not necessarily the time to buy, but it's the time to look. What about WA um, juniors with some sort of infrastructure? Like we've seen some juniors that are claiming the replacement cost of their infrastructure is like three times their market cap. Like they're just, but how much they've they've been beaten up? Replacement there... cost being the key word, mate. It doesn't mean you can sell it for that much. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly. So, but like, is there you know opportunity? Like, do you look at it from a point of a turnaround in the sentiment or a more more a transaction opportunity that these yeah. companies have been that beaten up so you got the mobs like Genesis that are you know they've just mop, finished mopping up Dacey and um, yeah. are they going to start uh, do you think a lot do of these mean incumbents or do you do you go for the high, higher risk um, that's not really been my game of focus I yeah. think because I don't have good answers to those questions mm. but but what I would say is you made the point about the replacement assets are, you know are they worth replacing right mm -hmm. you know do I, I might I might you can't be move them these days yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well that's the thing you know I might have I might have a you know I might have a crushing plant or you know processing plant or something uh, in an area that formerly was was a good producing area but but if there aren't good healthy you know prospects out there mm. for a brownfields or, or greenfields discovery um, what are you going to do? Um, so I, th I think that that's why, you know, that when you asked me in the beginning, that's w that's why the, the one that sprang to mind for me was Southern Cross Gold, just because I've been following, you know, S2 getting back in there. I've been following the story about would you find another Fosterville? I think you need something like that to galvanise attention, like what we found with Pilbara Gold back a few years ago. Well, what's your take on Victoria as a jurisdiction but Pretty horrible. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it'd think be how long probably it the to... bottom of the barrel for uh, Australia. Well, yeah, I reckon so. I yeah. reckon it is pretty poor. Um, yeah. I mean, given most of the others are pretty good. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and who, who's, I oh, know we've talked about it before, but refresh me on it. Who is driving it? Who driving. is driving the, um, is it purely the government or is it the... I, look, of, I was born in Victoria, government? but I accept no responsibility. For what's um, <laughs> Where, you know. Where's sort of the buck stopping with, or is <laughs> yeah. it just, or is, or is it? I don't a think the buck's stopping with anybody. I think it just keeps going around all over the place. So is no it a function of money? Like, is it like there's not the industry isn't beefed up enough to support probably this sort of stuff, or probably I think uh, you look. The, I think the bottom line is always money. Yeah. Um, 
to change a government's mind. And if so they, they need to, to be bribed. And if you think of yeah. alignment, yeah. Like in, w- exactly. in WA, right, like it's a very pro mining industry because so many people's salaries are actually tied, exactly. tied to the prosperity of that industry. In Victoria, it's absolutely not the case. And, yeah. and hence, you know, you've got a right. um, composition of, 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 of a population that whether whether or not that mine gets permanent or not, it, it's an intangible um, benefit. That, then there's a there's a, an anti-mining kind of sentiment amongst most Victorians. I would say that's yeah. the case. That's the case. Mm-hmm. And... It, and therefore, what will change that, I think, I'm not saying it will change, but what could change it, necessary catalyst, is if you make major discoveries of a new kind. That it's, Think how rich the Fosterville story became when they got mm. to depth and found the great improved. Um, and it, the bloody size. It was like a yeah, bloody, it, was exactly. like a, um, it looked like a boil growing out of its heart. Like yeah, it was yeah. just, it did not make sense. It just yeah. looked like this big abscess that was coming yeah. out. It yeah. was phenomenal, that it's, all It's body. total Jules Verne. You, know? you drill deeper and mm. there's nothing, right? And then you get the golden, you mm. know, the golden goose laying the golden eggs. Yeah. Like huge. It looked um, like a laid an egg. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, mm. but that's the opportunity. And we know there's, there's extensions of that belt. I forget the exact geological name for it, but... Um, there are extensions of that belt in parts of um, Tasmania with Flynn, uh, and then over in in the um, part of the northern uh, southern island of New Zealand, the north no. uh, north north western side. Oh, is that that? Um, is that where old that Santana? Is that what you're talking oh, about? I, I can't remember the names of the. There's two companies yeah, over bloody, there. Bloody, we need a fly. <laughs> so I do. It's like, head there, yeah. Kingsley. It's like when we're out with WA. <laughs> <laughs> Kingsley, why don't we round out with okay. a, uh, a couple of predictions. I'm not sure if you guys can think on your toes, but I want to hear if you had to take a stab. Yeah. Any, any commodity, an ASX company, what's the, uh, the next either, you know, M&A type deal, whether it's two companies merging or a oh, company yeah. that gets bid. If you could just take a random punt. Yeah. M- most yeah. likely to be acquired within the next 12 months. Okay. Let me think. Um, I think there will be a deal in the rare earth sector uh, because I think prices are going to get very cheap because I think government policy is kind of nutty uh, around keeping people away. So I think prices will get very cheap. Um, Linus has indicated they have an interest in, uh, you know, a heavy rare earth play. Um, uh, yeah. The only, the only real heavy rare earth play is Northern Minerals. NTU. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they've, they've already agreed for their... They have. To go they to have. So I don't goods. think it'll be them. Yeah. So I think it'll be Ionic. Uh, okay. Um, what, yeah. what do you think? West, West Farmers like previously had interest in rare earth. Like, yep. I think there was a bid for Linus back in the day. Um, yep. Do you think they ever go back and explore rare earth again? Oh, sure. If, if Linus got cheap enough, yeah. I think West Farmers would be there. Yeah. What about Iluca? I reckon West that's the more likely one. There's Let a big Iluca West Farmers sort of you yeah, know yeah, analog mm, between perfect management. idea. Yeah. I think that's quite possible. Um, so, okay, so, so suppose you are pitching that one, right? So you, I'll give my reasons for the Ionic Linus match after this one, but I reckon that's a very likely deal Yeah. should prices get low enough, okay? Right. Yeah, because West Farmers are super disciplined about buying at a price that gets them a great And you have to capital. ask what will do that, okay? So here is my answer to my own question, what will do it, <laughs> um, is to the best of my knowledge, Eluca has not yet sewn up their offtake for the rare earths plant that they're going to finish in 2020. So the offtake you mean as in who's going to get there? Who's going to get it? Product? Yeah. Government finance it. Yeah. Remember my study on Linus on where the rare earths went? Yeah. They're not going to go to the USA because they don't have enough demand. Yeah. Um, so who is who is Aluka going to sell their rare earths to? They can't sell it to Japan because Japan's full. Yeah. They t- Linus is already... They can't sell it yeah. to South Korea. They can't sell it to the US. They're, they're, they're depending on the emergence of other partners. Otherwise, it's got to go to China. And that, uh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. So let's do that hypothetical. Suppose what I said is right and they haven't got their offtake sorted. Suppose my conjecture that they, in the time it takes them to finish the plant, won't find sufficient offtake to accept it. It's then going to take a while to, to finish that plant, though. Well, but maybe they need to take a while to finish it. Yeah? I think they guided 2027. But yeah, you know, which still while. Well, that's it. Right? So yeah, that could yeah. that's the counter, right? So yeah. So if it takes them long enough, maybe the buyers appear. But we're we're dependent on the miracle of uh, Europe and the United States building lots of magnet plants to accept it. Mm. And if they don't, then the prospect is that Luke has to send it to China. Mm. That's not going to be a good look for the government. Mm. But the White Knight would be 
Wazis, a West farmers still. Yep. Who yep. who do you think will be will be the owner and operator of Kathleen Valley in three years' time? Ooh. <laughs> wow. Um, well, look. Um, let's let's be straight. Um, uh, Gina has the balance sheet to own it, right? Mm. Um, and they're going to build it, so she doesn't have to do that. Um, so I suspect it might be um, interest associated with Reinhardt. Do, do you think yep. that, that this deal that we've seen with Azure right now, the drill structure, yep. like if that gets an outcome on Azure, i.e. let's say um, Gina now, she, she's not happy being a, a 20% shareholder of a majority owned and controlled yep. SQM company. So she decides to lob her, her own bid. Yep. Now SQM have got a matching right, right? Yeah. SQM can match it. SQMs, happy days. There's yep. an outcome to get 100%. There's, what's, there's nothing stopping Albemarle from watching that playbook and then yep. going in with that exact same structure on Lion Town and there's a pathway to 100%. Or, or um, you know, Bajina already holding 20%, you know, can, can, can potentially negotiate um, a joint venture in, in can, that dynamic. Sorry, can Gina, once, if SQM match Gina, can then can Gina then go over the top or not? That's... No, I, 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 I don't believe so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's a matching right to match the bid. Yeah, but yeah. then, but she's is they she, then she removed from, but she can then bid higher again, can't she to take them? It's Does a, that it's match a matching right keep yeah, rolling. It's, so it's like your your bid is. Um, it, oh, I think it's, it depends if it's best and final. If it's best and final yeah. in the absence of a higher bid. I'll, look, I'd, I'd have to read the. the yeah, I think, I, think, I think we. But had I'm a, pretty sure it's, it's a matching right to match the, the highest bid. Otherwise, you just do it one SQM. cent higher, make yeah. the match, and if it lapses there, yeah, you can it's, just go it's, again. It's SQM have the right to match it, and then it's SQMs. Yeah. If, yeah. if they're there at that price, otherwise it's genius. Yeah. yeah. But you know, the one comment I make about all this speculation is that. If you look at both bidders, right? So Albemarle, uh, in one case of Liontown, and SQM in the case of Azure, um, and the comments from, from uh, we heard earlier to my article, what really, really matters to an investor, I would contend, is the, the bona fides and credentials of, of the bidder in terms of placing the material, right? You, 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 don't, you, don't, sell, you don't sell lithium concentrate at the supermarket, right? Um, Mm. You, you've got to sell it into a producing supply chain. And these guys have those connections. Mm. Just on um, lithium pricing, do you have a prediction in one year time? We've seen spodumene prices that are reported come off substantially in the last two or three yep. weeks. The last I'd heard sort of, um, you know, leaving Australia was 2050 US dollars per tonne, a 6% equivalent. Have you got a prediction for one year's time where that price will be? No, I don't because I don't really do that spot price forecast. But what I will say is I think that we're establishing that clearing price range now yeah. with the 2000. There are there's some are saying it should go back to where it was before, you know, 2018. I personally don't think it will. But the reason, the reason, fundamental reason for that is the, the, the growth rates the industry is calling for now in terms of tonnes per annum yeah. is, uh, is significantly higher CAGR than what it was back then. Yeah. And so I think the incentive pricing says it has to be higher than that. If it was twice that, that's probably about fair. So we might be fair now for the bottom of the market. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be pretty disastrous if it got to 500, 600, 700 dollars a ton. And all it would do is 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 reset the spring for it to shoot higher again. Yeah. I think. Because you wouldn't yeah. be able to feel that forward demand going out a couple of years. Like Rick Rule sort of told us, the cure for higher prices is higher prices. Correct. So yeah, we yeah, saw absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah that's Beautiful. It. Well, appreciate right. your time. Well, Thank you. Sensei. Cheers for popping by, mate. Good yeah. to uh, actually finally meet you. Uh, you were mm. one of my favourite episodes to listen to because oh, I uh, wasn't obviously there. <laughs> and I already, I already listened to all the ones I do anyway, just to make sure I get all the information in my head. <laughs> but um, no, I really, really enjoyed it, mate. Well, thank um, you. Thanks well, for Well, awesome to have a chat. So um, I, I love what you guys do and um, I get great pleasure out of your work. Oh, appreciate it, Kingsley. It's great to be having a chat. Well, we're thanks, flattered thanks to know that people that have been in the bloody industry so long, experts like yourself actually listen to us. So <laughs> if, we can, if we can stimulate you, I'm pretty blessed. Bloody happy. Very awesome, flattering. Mostly. Thanks for these two. Awesome. So, <laughs> right, Thanks let's, so much. Uh, let's bloody thank you. Thanks, Kingsley. That's day one of IMARC done, Money Miners. It and uh, Jesus, it's a bloody relief too because now we've done it. <laughs> yeah. Now we can relax because we're, we're trying to freaking get here and record something. But 
every took us four was, hours to set up. Took me two hours to do a piece because <laughs> I get pulled up along the way and you're talking to everyone. So yeah. now that we've got it out of the road, I feel like the world has yeah. been off my shoulders. Oh, yeah, God, Matty. Beauty. Oh, thanks to all the bloody uh, the sponsors back mm. across the ditch. And uh, I don't think any are over here, but tell you mm. what, I'm going to get, I'm going, <laughs> we've got a few slots left and I'm going yeah. to fill them right now. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to go through the trade show. So, oh, totally. We can't, we can't reveal the sponsors we haven't announced yet, Matty. We've got a, oh, we've got, yeah, yeah. We've got two more to announce no one more to announce this too many week. bloody sponsors Kingsley I'm losing track oh, yeah. you know, bloody terrible tough, problem to tough. have <laughs> but we, one, can, <laughs> we can thank Smek Terra Capital Anytime Exploration Services JP Search KCA KCA and Kdrill and, and yet, yes, future we introduced proof. Future Proof. Well, Monday we introduced Future Proof Consulting. Yeah, and MMTS at MMTS the beginning of the show. My morning title services. I think, I think we've got one more tomorrow. and a couple yeah. more to come out. I appreciate the support, guys. I'm going to find a couple. Cheers, sponsors, and Hooter cheers, Hooter. Kingsley. Thank you. Love your work. Cheers, Money Miners. We'll Hooter. see you for day two. <laughs> which will be you out. you got to give it a hooteroo. Which will be sort of out on day three. Hooteroo. We'll see you. Hooteroo. The information contained in this episode of Money of Mine is of general nature only and does not take into account the objectives, financial situation or needs of any particular person. Before making any investment decision, you should consult with your financial advisor and consider how appropriate the advice is to your objectives, financial situation and needs.